Welcome. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the chair of Streaming Media Conferences. I'm the chief marketing officer for Ideas. And this is session four of day one of our 10th Streaming Media Connect virtual event. We'll be back in Boston for Streaming Media East in May, May 17th for the Content Delivery Summit, and May 18th and 19th for the main Streaming Media East program. We'll also have workshops on May 17th. The website, streamingmedia.com forward slash East, is live. The program will be live in the next few days, certainly within the next week. So check that out. The earlier you sign up, the better deal you get on tickets to attend. Before we jump into this session, and yes, there is supposed to be a video of a cookie recipe. Well, not the cookie recipe, cookie ingredients visible right now. Before we jump in, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions for our presenter, please enter them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen rather than in the chat. That allows us to keep track of them more easily. And we'll get to those questions after John's presentation. Also, we do have subtitles turned on if you do not wish to view them on your screen, if you're seeing them, that is. You can go to the bottom of your screen where it says show captions or live transcript. Click on that and click disable transcript and that'll turn the captions off. Finally, this session and all of our Streaming Media Connect sessions will be available on demand starting next Monday-ish. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but certainly next week. Just go to streamingmedia.com and click on video and then conference videos or go to the link that our producer Steve Nathans Kelly just popped in the chat. We will have the chat open. Feel free to use it. But again, please put any questions for our presenter in the Q&A tab. I'd like to thank our diamond sponsor, Signiant, for making this entire week possible. We have a brief video message from them now. Wherever content needs to flow, the Signiant platform can move any size file over any IP network. At speeds, it can be up to 100 times faster than traditional transfer methods. More than 50,000 businesses use the Signiant platform to send and share files, automate movement of data between systems, exchange content with global partners, and move content to and from the cloud. The Signiant platform gives you the power to operate at the speed you need to run your business. And thank you to Fortinet for sponsoring this Tech Talk session. And we've got John Jacobs here from Fortinet. He's going to present a presentation called Winning Recipes for a Successful Zero Trust Architecture. John, welcome. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. You bet. Right, and you. As, as, as you've probably guessed, you're going to learn more than just the recipe for creating a zero trust architecture. You're going to learn another recipe as well. But as we dive into that, John... Can you give us just a brief overview of what exactly do you mean by zero trust architecture? Yeah, yeah. I didn't, uh, when I interviewed 10 years ago, I didn't think it was ever going to say, can you bake and have you worn an apron? So both firsts, I want to say that's great. Uh, and yeah, so the number one topic in security throughout the year, throughout last year has remained ransomware and mm -hmm. it's more prolific. There are more threat actors out there and ultimately one of the key elements to, to stopping and staying safer is zero trust. Now, this idea of zero trust is not wholesale new, and it's a, it's a combination of multiple components that enables the ability to control device access and user access to explicit applications for an explicit amount of time. So it's a big shift for a lot of companies from the, well, things are there, they're available and online, to a process that says, can we take specific steps, a la the recipe mm -hmm. and the analogy? I love analogies. So I thought, well, let's let's do one and let's uh, let's try it all the way through. So. Absolutely. So what are the primary objectives of, of zero trust architecture? Yeah. And let me share real quick. I'll, I've got one slide from this. I'll put that up on the screen. Should be able to see that pretty well. I'll put it in prezo mode there. There we go. And really the ultimate, I'm looking at the end recipe, the end of the recipe, and that is that we can validate devices as more and more people move around into different environments and different infrastructure. On top of that, we want to verify the user. And this is not just one time as the traditional sort of VPN login. Uh, it's the idea that we've got people moving in and out of infrastructures, uh, looking at the device itself, 
and we'll make an, another analogy of that, whether it's a structured or an owned device by the company, or if it's something of an unknown, right? You're at a kiosk or you're just, you know, perhaps in some sort of, you know, setting where uh, you don't control that device. And then looking at application access specifically. So no longer you have a tunnel, get access to everything, but specific applications, and then continue looking at that, continue looking and evolving that, that, uh, that encrypting traffic from the one point to the source to destination, and then it's a continuous process. So while we'll walk through the recipe once, we can walk through it multiple times. Sure. So what, what vendors play in this space? A multitude. And that's, I think, a good news, bad news type scenario that uh, there's no one that can simply say, push this button, all the things happen. Uh, because of the fact that it encapsulates multiple different technologies, multiple different components. Uh, we, we've got to walk through that, hence the, the analogy here I think is helpful, uh, and walk through the different components. And, you know, there's leading in infrastructure vendors. Uh, there's folks that focus on just on identity. There are people that focus just on application security and that component. So uh, we ultimately hope that people, you know, choose a best of breed, and it will probably end up with multiple components that just making sure they work together. All right. And is there is there an analogy or a comparison to home security that comes into play here that might help uh, attendees even more clearly understand how this works? I think there is. I actually think it's, you know, from if you look at just a historical perspective and how if you live in a, in a densely populated area, home security was maybe at one point not even an issue. If you rewind the clock and people will often sort of have the reminiscent good old days where you didn't lock your door and, you know, you basically you close the door and what was out of sight was out of mind. And that was, you know, sort of the, the intro. People then move to this idea of, well, you know what, there is a security and then there's a deadbolt or there's handles on the door that lock it. Uh, we really view that as if you want to do with the analogy context, um, something of a, of a firewall uh, where there is there's a perimeter, you control access, it's relatively manual. Um, and if you look at what's happened recently in security, it's been about video and the intelligence that's come along with it. Now, there aren't too many people that would say we do all things security because there's components of response and, and monitoring. But if we just take the one component of technology, it is, think of what we have, a, a large percentage of people now have a video camera sitting in front of their door and it records that, it puts that information somewhere, there's a notification process, it's intelligent about where you see movement. Uh, so I think I think it's a great analogy. I think we're getting smarter about access, control, who's there and what they want to do. Excellent, excellent. Well, how about you jump into your recipe and start cooking? Let's do baking. it. Let's start cooking. Uh, I'm going to stop this share because I got physical screens down here that'll work. Uh, I will put in a little quick plug. We do have, and this is a strange, it was part of our marketing team. I give them a lot of props, but a real cookbook from Fortinet. Uh, anybody that uh, sends an email to my marketing partner, Mimi Jackson, and get the, one of these out to you. And uh, that won't be the, the basis of this, but I thought it's an interesting tie-in because this is all interesting ground we're waging here. So, you know, really, if we look back to the, you know, the end results, uh, and I've got these on paper, but I'll, I'll flip through. If you look at the first thing, it's really, you know, the, your environment. Um, and I can put these up maybe so people can see them a little bit better. But that environment of, you know, what things happen, I'm using the analogy of, well, it's an oven. This is where we're going to cook things, folks. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Uh, and in this case, we'll put the whole recipe, but uh, 375 degrees, because we're using English standards that, of course, make no sense, but we still continue to use them. <laughs> so that is the reality. And if you look at, so one of the first things that we need to do in, in really realm of security and zero trust, this is absolutely critical, is this is the foundation. And what we've got here of a foundation is really, you know, in this case, I'm using flour, right? That's uh, the inventory. What is there to protect? You can't protect what you don't know you have. You certainly can't provide rules or context around that. So the first and foremost thing is we've got, you know, this base level of, I cheated a little bit here. I even put a little bit of protein powder for those uh, playing along at home. Uh, but there really is this idea of you've got to know what's going on. That lives oftentimes in a centralized database, whether that's a SIM uh, you'll hear acronyms of a SIM or a CMDB, Content Management Database. Uh, ultimately, the goal is we've got to know what's out there to protect. And that's got to be real-time. 
it's got to be updated in real time, it's got to be accessible, and it's got to have open access to both alert information, you know, take information in and push information out. So that's really the number one component, and we'll come back to that in, in just a moment. So what's the first thing you do then? Once you've now got the idea of inventory, one of the most critical components we add then, and, and this is really, you know, a key piece is, in this case, butter, one cup. I substitute in a little bit of applesauce. Nice little trick for people that want low fat uh, or lower fat. Uh, and this is identity. The next piece of zero trust is, and we, we talked about that from you know validation and from a user and device. Um, ultimately, the first piece of that is identity of a user specifically. And when we say identity, whether that's a service, whether that's a platform, whether that's a piece of a, of a larger solution people buy, uh, ultimately, it has to include multi-factor. That shouldn't be a new concept to anybody, but we, we always think it's worth mentioning, our public service announcement. Uh, to have multi-factor factor authentication is, is really, that is identity, so uh, in its better form. So, so we have that piece of it, and ultimately, that's where we're going to start. So, you know, we enter that. We enter that piece into the uh, the grand mixing scheme here. That's pretty easy. We get a little pieces of that out. It's the first time I've ever cooked on camera, so we'll see how this goes. There's no cheering or booing section, so that's the good news. And we move on. You know, well, I, I can I can cheer or boo if you want. I mean, hmm. let me think know? about that. I'm going to get back to you whether right. whether things if they end up in somebody's in in a, in a lap here somewhere. Right. Uh, if you add the next piece of this, this is really one of those key components, right? We're, we're building at level. So we've got identity, we put it, we've put uh, inventory, we put identity on top of it. So we know uh, the real piece here then, and this is peanut butter, we're making peanut butter cookies. So segmentation, perimeter security, this idea that now you've got the ability, we made that analogy of, you know, sort of that deadbolt on the door, uh, next generation firewall security is sort of a block a policy enforcement point, let's just call it that. Doesn't matter if it's a physical device, doesn't matter if it lives in a cloud, doesn't matter if it's a service or a device itself with a subscription. Uh, common forms of this would be a next-gen firewall. If you're a hosting or content company, it may be a, a web application firewall or a WAF, same type of thing. Uh, really this idea of, of having that segmentation and controlling access or enforcing that policy. A web application firewall really is just a, a next-gen firewall with a smaller rule set. So, so we take that peanut butter and that's, that's gonna go in here. We gotta, we gotta mix that in, and make it all part of the same little mixture, homogeneous. So that's key. We'll beat all these things together. You know, that'll be later on as we talk about what that really means when you put them together as part of the ecosystem of where does this really go? What, what do these pieces go? Um, the next thing you need in real, any good recipe, uh, hard to get around it. It's what makes a lot of things delicious, sugar. So the analogy here we're using is visibility. And you've got to have visibility in, in talking about whether that database and inventory is your SIM, but visibility really comes from a SIM or SIM type platforms. There's a little bit of a movement into folks as they move into larger cloud infrastructure, looking at cloud subscription services that monitor what goes on between multi-cloud and infrastructure. But really, ultimately, we've got, you know, this is just your base, your base sugar. One, you know, one cup, we'll put that in there. And we're mixing for those that are uh, cooking or baking aficionados. Uh, ultimately, what we're doing here is you, you put the, the butter and the creamy ingredients together, and you ultimately want to whip them together, right? We've got to, we've got to make that into a foundation that we build the other pieces on top of. So we've got a little bit different type of butter. Uh, and I think this ultimately the analogy we're using here uh, is, is brown sugar, but we're using it for an endpoint or EDR. Uh, this has been a really, really common trend for about the last, well, I'd say two years. And that is we need to have control over those devices because the devices have moved everywhere. A lot of us, it's just a mobile phone or a tablet or a laptop that's maybe not even company issued. There was a big trend, I'd say about five, seven years back of bring your own device. Um, for those of us that have been in a tech industry role long enough, it used to be, you know, guaranteed you 
you got shipped that laptop and that was the only one you used. Often cases now, it's it's what you bring, where you get access. So we need to know what it is in that device that is it compliant? Does it have components that you want in the environment? Are they both compliant with the environment, compliant with the rules that your company's put forth, and can you control that piece of equipment? That's this endpoint piece is pretty key, uh, and it's it's really blossomed from this idea that whether you want control or do you want to mitigate, if someone outside your network, if you've got people working at a remote site, uh, you know maybe they're on a, a shoot or a set, and they've got their own devices and they download malware. It happens all the time. So what can you do there? And ultimately, you want to control it, isolate them. And EDR endpoint is really that key piece or signal back to the rest of the network. And that's where this kind of zero trust magic starts to happen, that you're continuously looking at a posture check for that end device saying, are you running the right software? Are you running things that you shouldn't be running? Um, so ultimately, critical component. And if we do the analogy between sugar and brown sugar, a lot of people do or don't know, but it's you add molasses, get a little bit more of a, a browning agent. Uh, I'm no expert in the kitchen, but I do know a few things my wife's taught me. Um, the next component is you really need this integration. So you'd ask some of the vendors that play in this space, Eric, and it really, the, the logic here lies in the idea that it's unlikely that you'll have one size fits all. The environment changes, the needs of the business are evolving, the technology underlying is changing. There are entire parts of the solutions that you know maybe didn't even exist or weren't uh, you know readily available four or five years ago, and now they're just expected. So this part about and I love the analogy here with just with eggs um, is they're the binder. They are the partnerships and the ecosystems. So when you choose those components. And when you have those pieces of the infrastructure, making sure that they work together, making sure that they're able to be manipulated. If you're looking at an identity solution of an, in and of itself on its own, make sure that that identity solution has open access so that people can read and write information to it, that it can force a policy change. These are key, key components. Uh, and if you've ever tried baking without a binder, Eggs are the common one. People use flax and things of that nature, chia. But um, if you've ever tried baking without a binder, it does not turn out well. So the same kind of thing goes when you talk about this technology integration without partnerships, without the binder or the ecosystem. Uh, you, you've got to have those pieces put together. And the whole is much, much more delightful and delicious than the individual components as we approach a uh, higher level of entropy, I believe, or lower level. So a little bit of the to preference. Uh, I, I use this analogy is there is somewhat of a trend. Uh, it really depends on the industry and depends on what people's ultimate goals are of a centralized policy broker. Um, and this is that magic ingredient of vanilla, vanilla extract. Don't go for the cheap stuff, go for the real one. Uh, and that is, uh, I think it makes everything better when you talk about baking. I, I do think there's great potential, especially in certain environments, that that centralized policy broker will be the place most people interface. It will receive most of the information from on net, off net, policy updates, endpoint updates, uh, and that that can that key piece will be where really the magic happens. Uh, a common user interface, whether that's autonomous or direct user uh, updating policy, perhaps it's a corporate policy or just individuals. Maybe it's a reaction to some sort of new malware that's come out. Uh, but we vanilla just makes things good. So we'll uh, we'll throw that in there. Those things are really going to get all beat together, mixed up, and we put them in to ultimately, uh, IT operations. I love calling this. This is really, you know, this is my analogy for the blender. Those components are tested, tried, true, and, and operated by, depending on the org, SecOps, NetSecOps, um, 
I see most organizations moving to a converged infrastructure where they're not just a networking team or a security team. So I use the more generic terms, you know, IT operations. That's sort of this base function. Um, and it really is the, the ultimate of where that, where that um, foundation forms. You've got to have this ready. You put it in the blender and this analogy will we'll mix it up, becomes this, uh, this nice, nice sort of creamy mixture, creamy consistency. Uh, for those in the pure baking analogy, you really do want to whip butter because uh, it really it it actually emulsifies it or excuse me, it puts a little bit of uh, oxygen in it, air whips it up. It's a good thing. So you'll get a little bit a little bit more mileage out of it. And we really want to talk now, and this is really the, this is the dry powder, you know, and if you you have this whole dry powder mix that's that's sitting off to the side here, right? We've got our inventory that's sitting there. That was just flour. Uh, we've got to add components to it. And again, there's no go pick zero trust from a drop down menu. But some of these components, for those in the baking world, you certainly need baking soda. Uh, that's how things rise. Uh, baking powder is how they'll rise and brown. Um, but I would put this as the analogy of cloud controls. This varies depending on the industry and the organization. But ultimately, you're going to have some level of cloud control. For if you're a cloud first organization, this may be where the majority of your focus is. Uh, a cloud access broker or somebody that's controlling and monitoring what's going on inside those resources. So, you know, we'll mix that into the dry powder mix here. Cuz really this dry powder mix, my analogy there, we'll we'll get it when it's done, but this is where the real business is happening. And then we'll, we'll integrate the two. We talked about baking powder, the magic of that. Always key to look up those ingredients and you realize that baking soda and baking powder are pretty, pretty similar, some key differences. Uh, my analogy here, I'm going to put this as deception, reconnaissance, looking at the dark web. This is a pretty key piece to knowing what's going on outside the doors of your organization. Is there's been some focus and organizations in some places do care about brand reputation as your website being defaced and whatnot. Uh, I think that's lesser of a focus, but what really is happening more is, are my user credentials out on the dark web? Are, have my users fallen for some sort of phishing trap? Are they using corporate email domains for signing up for that next subscription service for toothpaste or whatever new service of subscription you're gonna subscribe? That is the key component of, again, of the overall recipe, very key component. And it's becoming more and more prevalent of both the, the reconnaissance and deception. So, you know, I could open the windows when this is baking and, and see if, if the neighbors are sneaking around or, or sniffing around. Uh, but ultimately, it's what's going on inside or outside of your network. A lot of times people don't know until something bad happens. And what we don't want is to be sitting around waiting for, you know, the smoke detector to go off saying there's something burning. We want a real understanding of perhaps malicious, perhaps innocent behavior, but ultimately we want to be able to measure and monitor that. That is this idea of deception. If you've got a critical server that lives out there and you think people would probably try to hack it, well, why not clone it? and find out is, are people using it correctly or are people trying to do something nefarious? So that's that's our that's our baking powder analogy. So we throw that in as well. Starting to look like a real, starting to look like a real combination here. And I'm running out of little dishes, so all good things. It's getting there for sure. Yeah. Salt, what can you do without salt? You used to pay workers. So you've got to have it. Um, I think, you know, I, I put the analogy here of even a little more so from the deception realm. I, I do think that's a key component. Um, you can you can bake without salt. Doesn't quite taste the same. Makes makes everything better. Eric, you and I were talking about that earlier. Just go out to a restaurant. You salt realize. and butter. You don't want to know how much salt and butter is actually in your food. <laughs> you it's one of the magic parts of baking, I think, is you start to understand once you see the components, it gives you an appreciation for it. Um, I'm not the I'm not the expert in my household, but uh, I, I play one on on video right now on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, you know, an optional thing, and I do think this from my analogy is a little bit optional, chocolate chips in this case, but, you know, is this idea of machine learning and automation. Um, I don't use the term AI. I think that gets a little bit too overhyped. Uh, and I do think there are some really interesting things uh, the, 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 in the AI realm that have just happened. Uh, we won't go into that this conversation, but uh, machine learning is a different thing. So if we look at automation, the goal of automation in security and zero trust is really remove basic repetitive tasks. If we know that someone's trying to access with a device that doesn't have the right security software, just go push the right security software. You don't need a person and, and someone to integrate or, or take a hold of that. And machine learning will just tell you what those things are as they happen, as they repeat. So ultimately we want this, this goal of that the, the machine gets a little smarter so that the operators can up level to do tasks that are really more complex, more creative, uh, more difficult, right? If you've got SOC analysts or you've got people that are looking at the network, um, that idea of machine learning should tell them where to go look and how to go look in the right places. So this is that dry powder mix. I like this analogy, made it up. Um, is this, you know, this is sales and business operations. You know, this is this is just waiting. This is just waiting for revenue. It's waiting for profits too, Eric. We gotta have that. So revenue out to bottom. Ultimately, you mix all these things together for those in the baking world. The reason you do that is because if you stick pieces of baking soda or baking powder and you've ever bitten into that, uh, you got to make sure it's mixed in so you don't get that. You don't want the moisture in there yet. You want that really divided. And you don't want to beat up the flour too much. So you don't want to beat up the sales and business operations. Just give them a, give them a little bit of swirl. Well, uh, maybe we call that a reorg. Uh, <laughs> if you're in the sales world at any point, we know. Just give it a little reorg and try it again. Uh, no, that's uh, I, I I love that analogy, and I, I think ultimately this is this is now ready, right? This is the these are the components that are ready for the mixture together, including my optional chocolate. So one thing one thing we haven't talked about is how how do you? I mean, I know how you measure in a recipe for peanut butter cookies, but how do you measure in a recipe for ZTA? Great question. And there's no single right answer. There is ultimately a risk profile for your organization. And what that risk profile equals is a budget. And I think that's the, the most clear message that I try to deliver to folks that I, that I interface with is with unlimited money, you can become the most secure organization in the world. And you know, you'll probably never be hacked because there are so many organizations easier. You're not the lowest hanging fruit. The question really is where does that balance lie? Uh, and, and, and from the organization's perspective, there's some pretty good measurement formulas that talk about what's the intended risk or what's the cost of risk, average life expectancy. How often do you expect your employees to you know, fall victim to ransomware, or excuse me, to a phishing campaign. Uh, that's a pretty well-known statistic now. Putting that into the formula will come out with a real budget. And that budget, I think, should follow those same components almost in order of the recipe. I think that's a, a probably more distinct answer to your question is, if you're gonna allocate funds and budget, pick those key pieces and do them right. If you can't afford to do it right, uh, know that there's there's a pin there to to revisit. And the the mistake I see some people make is you know they substitute an ingredient or they go cheap and they figure it's done. They check the box, and I think that has the potential to cause more harm because people then assume it's covered, right? Oh, I already put the you know I already put the vanilla. It's use the cheap stuff. Know that it's missing, and budget for it. Sure. Right. So that's the dry powder. And we've got the, you know, we've got our full dry powder sales, business operations ch churning along. And, and now we go to integration. You know, this is really, you know, throwing these two pieces together. If we, we follow the full baking analogy, uh, you don't want to, you don't really want to beat it up too much, right? You want, you want this stuff all beat up heavily. Got to beat up on those IT folks. Uh, make sure, make sure they're tried, tested and true. 
Uh, and then, you know, we'll be gentle with the sales and business mm -hmm. posts. We'll, we'll just fold them in, as you'll see in many recipes. Uh, I used to scoff at that, and my wife actually taught me there's some good reason. Um, but this comes, in my analogy here, comes to this introductory training and education, right? How do we make it part of the culture so it's not this arduous task, but ultimately, it's part of the business. This, once these two things are integrated, we're, they're really part of the business flow and people don't scoff or roll their eyes or, oh, I have to you know, use this token to access devices and services. That's just what you do. And as we move into a more digitally driven world, I think we're pretty much there in a lot of cases. Um, you know, you could, the, the, I was going to use a great analogy earlier if you say how the, how the industry has evolved. Uh, if I stay with the cookie thing, you know, if you wanted a cookie at some point years past, you did this. You went through the work and the steps. I, I probably could get a crumble cookie delivered to my house in about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so if you want that and you want full, you know, structured uh, delivery, there are organizations that, you know, manage providers that will put it all together and deliver it to your door. You'll, you'll pay a premium for that. And one of the pros and cons, uh, as we've talked about, is you know the ingredients here. You know what you've put in. You know, you know, can you substitute? Do you find that, you know, you need a more premium ingredient or ingredient piece? Uh, or do you want it as just a whole cooked environment? Right. And do you want applesauce or butter or a mix of both? I mean, you know, you have no control with the off the shelf or the service providers uh, in that realm, you have no control over the yeah. breakdown of these individual ingredients. Absolutely. And I think, you know, depending on the organization and the culture, that really does matter. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a fundamental shift in the amount of flexibility. Um, do you want to see what's going in, in, in the in the mix? Some people do, some people don't. No right or wrong answer. You will pay a premium for that. I think that's the one point I always highlight to people uh, you know, doing things on your own, taking the pieces, it is extra work. Uh, you will often end up with a more tailored and custom and maybe better for the org. Uh, you maybe save a little bit of money, but there is a cost to it. You've got to have somebody mixing them up, right? What kind of environment do you put them into? You know, I, I like this analogy, which you probably can't see it very well, but, you know, so it's sort of a baking pan. You know, if you're if you're looking at something like this and nobody puts cookies into a baking pan, you know, structured environment, you want it to come out in a specific way. My analogy here is a structured environment may be, uh, you know, an airport kiosk. They know exactly what that device is. They know exactly what it runs, what it can access and not. That's a very different approach to the implementation than unstructured. And I've got my unstructured environment, which is just a flat pan. Ultimately, um, some of these analogies are great. I do a lot of analogies too, Eric. I want I've you noticed. To... Yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. Some are good. <laughs> some are bad. I don't know. This one, I'm this just one, run with be, it, man. I may be taking this all the way. Uh, this is all. Are you actually going to run the Mixmaster on camera? That's my question. I debated it. It's a little loud. A little bit. You know? Yeah. Uh, I could put it on mute and you could, you could entertain people while that rolls. Uh, you know what? Let's not. <laughs> All right. See, we like options. We like options. But, you know, in this model of an unstructured environment, I really think, you know, the analogy there is good, which is this is anywhere, right? This is this is that remote employee. Maybe it's the crew that's out on a, on a site. Uh, maybe it's, you know, a, somebody who's working from home, whatever that is. Uh, that is, we don't know. We don't have all the pieces, but we know that we've put the ingredients together right, that we can deliver it in that fashion. The alignment, which I'm, I won't because we're not going to beat these things together right here, mm -hmm. but uh, I like this analogy, and this is true with the, the old the old peanut butter cookie recipe. If people have seen the little marks on it, there's reason for that. Uh, again, education from someone not myself. Um, but if, if in this particular recipe, peanut butter doesn't fall, it is more dense, right? Because of the protein and the, the actual density of it, it doesn't fall like a lot of other cookies. So you got to smash them down reason people put the sugar on there is you got to, you know, make sure that the fork doesn't stick. So that's kind of the, the two-step magic touch of, you know, once you get the cookie scooper, if you haven't invested in that. Um, I'll tell you right now, greatest, greatest investment in your kitchen. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I don't have an analogy for that, Eric, though. I wish I, jeez. 
It's all right. I think I fell apart with the cookie scoop. I, I lost my analogy. Yep. You reached the end of the analogy road. I did. I did. <laughs> Uh, we've reached a fork. At, no, I'm kidding. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. <laughs> ah! uh-huh. I, so when are you done? You know, that is a great question. Um, and what does it look like when it's done? Yeah, ultimately. So my analogy with the fork, really fishing and testing. I think that's mm-hmm. a key piece of it, right? So that idea of aligning it to the right environment. In this environment, we want to make sure that there's, it's a little different. Uh, And I want to make sure that people get that it's going to be different in every environment. Uh, And and the outcome is a tried and tested from a a recipe perspective. But ultimately, I think the better analogy or the better statement here is it's a continuous improvement process. So I don't think we're ever done eating cookies. So we want more. And hopefully you're like most people. You want to continue to improve that recipe add some pieces of a little one component. Maybe you streamline some other component. Um, Maybe you want to take individual, you know, outsource. Maybe you don't want, you know, some people will go all the way down to, you know, creating, grinding their own flour. Maybe you want a service that's pre-mixed with multiple components in it. You can buy, you know, a boxed type flour mixture that has, you know, all these little pieces in it. If that's, you know, your, your level of effort. But from the zero trust piece, it is a analyze, look at where the process has come, and then look at where it can be improved. That that comes from knowing what's going on. And this is where I do think deception is a key component. Um, Knowing who's trying to knock on the door, knowing who's trying to fish your organization, who's trying to gather those credentials. Um, So I think it's a constant cycle. And the good news is that being more secure, there isn't a need to be 100% secure. There's almost no ability to do that. Uh, That's why people have sort of pushed back against the zero trust, right? They, well, zero trust, just unplug the network. Uh, It's really controlled, intentional trust. And and that should be an, an evolutionary process that continues Maybe there are too many people accessing too many resources, and the idea is to, to simply squeeze that down. Uh, I think one of the key points of this is how do you measure it? And ultimately, I tell people this, that you measure success in a zero trust implementation. First, can you revoke access? Can you take away access from someone dynamically? If you can do that, you're a pretty good way down the road. You're, you're probably 70 or 80% because you knew what it was, you knew where they were and what they were doing. And you said, nope, you've changed job roles. You no longer have access to these servers, these services, these you know resource, or you're temporarily covering for someone in your organization. That's a key piece. And then monitoring that to make sure, are people using all in access? I think one of the easiest things an organization can do is look at how many times an admin account is used. That'll tell you. If people are taking the easy road, crumble cookie delivery, uh, that oh, analogy yeah. doesn't work. Damn, but I, I try. <laughs> uh, but if people are taking the easy road, uh, you know, look, we, we all get a little lazy at times and we go, ah, I don't want to create a service account and have it do multi-factor. And then if I've got it, you know, other people, um, monitoring that level of engagement is really a key piece to knowing how that refinement happens and knowing if you're in a good steady state, uh, it's not to say that this is a treadmill that never ends. It's just, it's a constant improvement process. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to, we really want people to know. And the the yield is uh, delicious results, hopefully. I wanted to pull this Martha Stewart magic if I did mix these up, because I put, you know, where you do the time machine. Right. So so you've got the results there. Look at this. I mean, Look at that. Would, you, would you even know? I didn't do the trick where you're supposed to put the one in and then take it out. I know. I'm a little disappointed, but we'll cut you some slack. I know. So <laughs> I did get the, I did get an apron and it's got some, you know, some sassy apron writing on it. So maybe we've dug that out. That's good. Perfect. Perfect. Well, that was terrific. I love it. I love the analogies. Um, and as you said, the Fortinet cookbook is available. If anyone wants to email uh, Mimi Jackson, that's mjackson at fortinet.com. I think Steve will pop that into the chat once again. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for sharing your recipe for both Zero Trust and for uh, peanut butter cookies. 
you know, we, we mix it up. We like Indeed. to, uh, yeah. Thanks for As having I me. As I said earlier, a day of firsts at Streaming Media Connect. And for myself. Uh, Indeed. All right. Well, thanks again, John, and thanks to Fortinet for sponsoring. Uh, thanks to Signet for sponsoring this entire week. We'll be back at 5.30 Eastern time for our next session, which will be a discussion around how to do virtual and hybrid events right, and probably a little discussion about how to do them wrong, too, and what to avoid. So we'll see you then. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Gift card. Oh, gift the gift card. card. I thought we announced that at the beginning, but I'll announce it again. Oh. Michael Weber correctly identified that the tune that Steve Nathans Kelly played at the beginning in the walk-up music was Machine Gun by the Commodores. So, Michael, keep your eye out for an email later this week with your gift card. And that will wrap it up.